from Wiener, Arkansas. And I was standing in front of Boatman Dorm, reaching into my pocket, and I found myself with my keys to my car. It was spring break week, and he needed a ride home. I was off on a, a trip with a group, and, and there I was with the keys in my hand and a smile on my face, somewhat forced, as he took the keys to my car. Now, my car I had picked up in Nebraska on the side of the road. I think I had paid around $1,200. My grandma probably paid half of that. It was a Geo Tracker, really a wannabe Jeep is what it was. It was a black Geo Tracker. I could take the canvas top off of this car and drive through the wind in Joplin. My wife and I dated in this car. And as I handed the keys, there was just kind of this hesitancy to let go of them. But I did. I let go. He drove away. I drove away. A week went by. Came back on campus. Week of V went well. And I waited for my car. I stood outside Boatman Dorm. And I waited to see the car come over the hill by Goodman Dorm and down the hill. I heard my car as it came up over the hill and came down the hill and turned the corner. And as I did, I saw this black geo tracker turn the corner. And there on the side of my car was a, what had been a black door, a white door instead. For some reason, he had turned my car into an Oreo cookie on wheels. And my car is turning the corner, and I can, it can just feel myself. And the car pulls up, and he pulls out the keys, and he hands me the keys with a smile. But there's this question hanging in the air. What happened to my car? And he begins to tell me a story of an accident in a parking lot and how he had fixed everything by going to the junkyard and finding a, to a door to a geo tracker. It just happened to be white. I remember that exchange of the keys and just feeling that, that moment of, you still owe me something here. And one of the things I've recognized in the midst of life, in the midst of family, and in the midst of ministry is that relational transactions take place every day is that some of, some of them, I realize, some of them are major transactions, uh, transactions like abuse, transactions like abandonment, transa transactions like divorce, and we wrestle with those debts. But I also am aware that all the more often in my life are the, the common, the microtransactions that take place in the midst of relationships Someone wakes up in the morning and you walk by them and you're in a good mood in the morning and you greet them with a saved and sanctified kind of greeting in the morning. And they bark back with you, somewhat demonic in the morning. And you're thinking, oh, maybe it's a roommate who leaves a mess or a parent who frustrates, a family member who disappoints and those, those transactions take place. I wonder what would happen if we could, imagine if we could do this. What if we could see uh, imaginary numbers on top of people's heads and kind of see where their, where their transactions are landing? And so you cross someone in the dorms, and it's someone who has bothered you, and for some reason they've offended you, and their number begins to tick down. You, you can see numbers. Walk by the people in your life right now. C can you walk by some of the people in your life? and see the numbers that float above their head. You see, for Peter, in our text today, even he has a little bit of a number. We're going to find ourselves today in Matthew chapter 18, if you have your Bibles. And, and we're, when we find, come to Matthew and we come to Peter, he's going to throw out this number that should be floating above people's heads about this relational transaction. How many times should we forgive? Here's my question, though. Is it possible to follow Jesus and not forgive? Is it even possible to follow Jesus and not forgive? The context of Matthew 18, 21 is in the context of brokenness. Just follow down the line in Matthew chapter 18, this teaching block of Jesus and Matthew, and you come across, you come across the, the disciples arguing with one another. You come across a sheep that has gone astray. You come across 
a brother who has sinned against you. And Jesus, in the midst of that teaching, saying, wherever two or more gathered, there I'll be with you all as well. And, and we, we discover that this is more than a promise that Jesus will be present in our Bible studies or our small groups, but it's this promise that Jesus will be there in the context of our conflict. So, so maybe here's a question for you this morning. Whether it's conflict you find yourself in or conflict that you are heading into, what if we were just as aware of Jesus' presence in the midst of conflict as we are in the midst of our church building or in the midst of even communion. Jesus promises his presence, and then we come to our text. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then he throws out this number. As many as seven times, Jesus So so you're walking by. Can you see this number seven above people uh, that that you see every day? Uh, I mean, I could just put it in the context of my family. I think one of the reasons God gives us children is that we can practice the art of forgiveness. Uh, My daughter the other day was at the proctor's house. And, and I asked her if I could tell this story. She, she was there, and it was just one of those moments where she wasn't obeying her parents. We have three rules in our family. Obey your parents, respect one another, and be kind. And she broke all three of them. It was at the proctor's house. And we get home, and it's like, oh, man. And the ego and pride and all of those things are going on in the midst of us as parents. And, and we go into our daughter's room, and she's broken, and, and I pray with her that night, and, and she hands me a note to lay out on the stairs for her mom. I, I want you to have a chance if we can put that note up there. She puts this note, and she lays it out on the stairs for her mom to see. I'm sorry for having a bad attitude. She spells like her father. <laughs> I hope you forgive me. I love you. I laid this note on the stairs and just waited for my wife to come up the stairs. And both of us had tears in our eyes. Every day we are confronted with these relational transactions. Sometimes they are major transactions, at other times they are minor transactions. And Peter asked this question, this number is in the air, as many as seven times? It seems somewhat generous into kind of the rabbinic world at the time. Seven? But could you imagine only having seven in the midst of your family? in the midst of your friendships, only seven. And Jesus, in his typical fashion, says, I do not say to you seven times, but in my authority I say to you 77 times. Let's multiply that, he says. There's a little bit of an echo in the text of maybe from the book of Genesis. A guy named Lamech is bragging, and he says, if Cain's vengeance, if Cain's vengeance was seven times, then mine's gonna be 77 times. And he kind of boasts this vengeance And and maybe Jesus in this moment is wanting to take this ancient, relational, broken system and change it. I come from a family of brokenness. And I understand how this system has got to change. And so Jesus says, maybe it's 77 times. And then he goes into a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, verse 23, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him with 10,000 talents. Now, now you and I both understand that with just two words, Jesus couldn't state a higher concept of an amount. With just the two words he says here. It's like saying he had the national debt strapped to his shoulders. And, And so the king's wanting to settle accounts. He can't settle his own debt. When I look back, and I think of all the people I've hurt, Not just, we typically think major transactions here. But kind of like the the world of microfinancing that we live in, a dollar here, a dollar there, a dollar here, we can rack up quite the debt. And here is this man who can't get out of his debt. The king wants to settle accounts, and since he couldn't pay, his master ordered that he and his family be sold to pay his debts. And I do know this about myself, maybe reading into the text a tad that my, do, my debts do have implications to my family. So the servant falls on his knees, listen to his prayer, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. He can't pay everything. And out of pity, the word there is the word splankna. It's that compassionate word that wells up within Jesus. 
And out of pity, out of compassion for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. And just like in a lot of Jesus' parables, we're tempted to think, that's the end of the story. That's it, right? Father, a son leaves home, squanders his father's wealth, he comes back, the father throws his arms around the son, and we're tempted to think that's the end of the story. But like Jesus in his parables, a lot, oftentimes it's not the end of the story. This servant leaves, and he's singing amazing grace. You can see him whistling down the road. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And he's whistling, singing amazing grace. He's been set free. He's singing the favorite song of the day. And he comes across someone who owes him a debt. He sees the number on top of their head. And the story should go, could go like this. And out of this overwhelming overwhelming sense of forgiveness and grace, he extends grace and mercy. That's how you'd expect the story. We expect expect the story to end there. He left, he was forgiven, end of story. Because too often, that's how we end our story. What God has done to us too often has little implication to how we treat one another. And so we come to the middle of this story, and we realize, we realize this, that forgiveness is central to our Christian experience. Forgiveness is central to everything that we are as a Christ follower. But I also recognize this, that this isn't the end of the story. Because forgiveness is not only central to the Christian experience, it's central to the Christian expression. I want you to back up in the book of Matthew and and recognize the context in the book of Matthew, the context of brokenness. Matthew chapter five, verse seven, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Matthew 5, 39, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. Matthew 5, 44, I tell you, love your enemies and pray, pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter six, forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Matthew chapter 7, in the same way you judge, you'll be judged with the measure you use. It'll be used to you. Matthew chapter 9, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so that question for me, as I'm faced with those relational transactions, and sometimes they are major transactions, and other times they are just the day-to-day passing moments of my kids coming up and me being frustrated, with me passing by a friend and me having heard words that they had said that they didn't know I I had heard. I came to a place in ministry at one point where my favorite verse in the Bible was in John chapter 224. Jesus did not entrust himself to men for he knew what was inside the heart of men. And you just wall yourself off. And and, and here is this, this concept, this question that hangs in the air. Is it even possible to follow Jesus and not forgive? Well, the servant goes out in Matthew chapter 18, 28. And he finds this other servant who has this debt hanging over his head. It's a sizable debt, 100 denarii, a few months' wages. It's not like it's no small thing. The same prayer is heard, have patience with me. The same knees are bowed, have patience with me. But then the phrase is, he refused. And in the story, there's something inside of us that cringes as we see the injustice How could this man who left the king's throne room with a debt he could not pay go and choke, literally choke someone who owed him such a small debt in comparison? And we find out this principle, this principle of unjust scales. When we weigh the wrongs done to us more than the wrongs we've done, we will struggle to forgive. Whenever we come to the place that we weigh the wrongs done to us more than the wrongs we have done, we will struggle to give. In fact, my expression of forgiveness is directly correlated to my experienced forgiveness. Paul says the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is my favorite verse to use in weddings. Verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Because sometimes that's what it will take in a family. Sometimes that's what it will take in a friendship. Sometimes that's what it will take in a church is to get up every morning and and put on those clothes of Christ and to bear with one another. And then he says, and forgive one another. If you have a grievance against someone, forgive 
in the same way the Lord forgave you. Above all these things, put on love that binds them together in perfect unity. But that's not what we see in this servant who goes out and refuses forgiveness. And so the answer to my question, is it possible to follow Jesus and not forgive? Jesus seems to give us the answer that we wrestle with at times, no. If we follow Jesus, we follow his heart of compassion. We follow his sacrifice of love. We follow, follow his value for people despite our own hurts. And maybe, maybe we come to a parallel passage like Luke chapter 17, verse 4, where Jesus says, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, man, they've really been going at it. The number has ticked down all the way from seven all the way down to zero in one day. Jesus says this, you still must forgive them. You want to follow me? Forgive them, he says. And then the apostles, and I resonate with this, the apostles say this, increase our faith. Increase our faith to forgive that's not a connection I always make, faith and forgiveness. Got to have enough faith to forgive. I, I might connect this. I, I have to have enough faith to do something that gets me out of my comfort zone. I have enough faith, I have to have enough faith to give generously to others. God, I have to have enough faith. The disciples say, God, give us enough faith to forgive. Forgiveness is central to my expression. So let me, let me kind of ask and, and, and take the sermon and turn a corner and ask it this way. How is it that forgiveness expresses our, our faith? We know that it's ex an experience. How is it that faith, that forgiveness expresses our faith to others? And so I want to give you three statements, three, the, three general statements of how it expresses our faith. Number one is this. Forgiveness expresses my faith in God's justice. Maybe you heard the story before of, of a mom who heard their kid, her kids screaming up in the room. There was a, a two-year-old uh, daughter with a four-year-old son. The two-year-old daughter had a hold of the son's hair. He was screaming at the top of his lungs in pain. The mom came in. This is normal in my family, by the way. The mom came in, and she's like, what's going on here? And, and, and the young child had a hold of the brother's hair, and he's screaming, and everyone's screaming, and, and mom is trying to release the grip on the hair. And, and she tries to calm everyone down, and she says, there, there, you know, your younger sister didn't know what she was doing. It'll be okay. She left the room. First mistake. She left the room, and as she leaves the room, she hears a scream again. This time it's the younger daughter. She rushes back into the room, and the, the boy is pulling his little sister's hair. She says, what's going on here? And this, the boy says, she understands that it hurts now. <laughs> and we're kind of like that. We want things to be even. We have this God-instilled sense of justice in us. And yet the Bible teaches us this, Proverbs 20, 22, do not say, I will repay evil. Instead, the word there is wait. Wait for the Lord. Or maybe it's Romans 12, 18. As far as it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Good luck with that, by the way. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room. Wait and leave room for God's wrath. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Overcome evil with good. At the end of October, I heard a story of a young mother. She was shopping. She was shopping in a grocery store in Oklahoma. And as she was shopping, she reached back and realized that her wallet with her money was gone. She did like a lot of you would do. You start to panic. She started to replay what had transpired in the midst of the, the grocery store. And she realized that someone had bumped into her. She connected the dots. She went on a search, a manhunt, in the midst of that grocery store to track this young man down. You could see here with kids in tow pushing that grocery cart, determined to find him. And when she encountered this man, she, he saw her coming. You can imagine his eyes as she was coming his direction. As he, she confronted this young man, she gave him two options. Option number one, I call the police. Option number two, I pay for your groceries. He gave her the wallet back, and the two of them, with kids in tow, made their way up to the front of this grocery store. And as she tells the story, as they near the front, tears are beginning to run down this young man's cheeks. $27 later, he tells his story, and there's this story of forgiveness that is told. 
wait and leave room. You know, forgiveness says, I let it go to God. Forgiveness says, I let it go. I left it behind to God. But, but I also want to recognize this this morning. Forgiveness doesn't say it didn't hurt. Man, I've talked to some of you. Some of you have even given testimonies in front of high schoolers. Forgiveness doesn't say it didn't hurt. It doesn't say I'm, I'm going to trust. It doesn't say there's not going to be consequences. Forgiveness says I'm going to let it go to God. I'm going to trust it to him. And so I want to challenge you when you struggle to forgive, that forgiveness expresses your faith in God's justice. Uh, Similar to how Genesis tells the story of Joseph, that at the end of Joseph's Joseph's, uh, story, we have this encounter with his brothers. They're afraid he's going to have vengeance on them. And he says this, do not fear. Am I in the place of God? And, And then he transitions, and he says, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And that's really the second faith faith statement. Forgiveness expresses my faith in God's sovereignty. Specifically, that God can use my pain and recycle it for good. Forgiveness is me expressing to God, God, I don't know how. Do you ever wrestle with the how? God, I don't know how you're going to take this and use it for good. God, why? Why? But faith expresses that you trust God nonetheless. And so there's a Romans 8, 28, in the context of groanings, we know that in all things God works for the good. But, but I've also seen it in my own life. I've seen it at times how God can take some of my deepest pains and create in them my best platform for ministry. I've seen how God said, I want you to take your hurts and I want you to turn them into healing. I've seen that take place and I've seen it from you. I've seen it from students, I've seen it from leaders in the church, how they say, you know, we'll take the loss of our child, and we're going to minister to those who lose a child. I've seen it in those who have said, you know, we're going to take an affair in the midst of our marriage, and we're going to take it and we're going to minister to others who have broken marriages. I've seen God turn hurts into healing. Forgiveness expresses my faith in God's sovereignty. Maybe we could also take these statements and, and not, not only make them an appeal for you to be faithful and have these attitudes, but maybe we can also make them an approach of how to bring comfort for us to trust. Maybe what I need is I need to trust that God is just. Maybe I need to trust that God will bring good. But here's the third part. Forgiveness expresses my faith in the sufficiency of the cross. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And I have to ask myself, how much blood is enough? Whose blood is enough? When I encounter the friend of mine who offended me, who, who spoke words that so deeply hurt, Do I find myself praying that somehow he is hurt in return? Whose blood is enough? When I come to a family that's broken and I can trace it generationally through generation after generation, whose blood is enough? Whose blood is enough to pay for the pain that I have? And I imagine that some of my pains pale in comparison to some of yours. But what if instead of numbers on top of people's heads, what if instead of these numbers of debt, maybe they be plus seven or negative 45, What if instead of numbers, I began to see a cross? Can I ask this question? Is Jesus' blood enough? Is the pain that he went through, the payment he he paid, is it enough? And so I find myself in ministry, and it's just a few years ago, I find myself with one of my deepest friends in in located ministry. I had stayed at his house when I interviewed, and I find myself at his house. I'm bringing him communion. He had been arrested, and he was facing seven to 20-some years in jail. I didn't want to go. I was so frustrated and broken. His family was broken. He was leaving two kids and a young mom. He's leaving, he had, he's one of those guys you look at and you go, you have everything. You have a six-figure income. 
how could you do this? And I'm there and I'm walking in with communion in one hand. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how I'm going to ever be able to look him in the eye. And as I'm walking in, I, communion seems to weigh a little heavier. And I reach out my hand to shake his hand. And I came to this realization that I need to see people through the blood of Christ, even those who have deeply hurt me. Because there's this truth. Whenever we focus on the wrongs done to us more than the wrongs we've done, we will struggle to forgive. And yet whenever we focus on the blood of Christ and the love that he had for those wrongs, we can do nothing but forgive. How could we follow Jesus and not forgive? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, God, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors.